Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna to do a quick mic and video check. Pete, can you hear and, and see me okay? I can, yep. Perfect, Michelle, can you hear and, oh, perfect, there we go, got some videos. <laughs> perfect, very nice. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. We got some exciting topics on the agenda. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So go ahead and get comfy. We're gonna have a working lunch from home today. Go ahead and turn up your mobile device, your computer, or any other laptop or mobile device that you're using today. Everyone will be in listen-only mode. Calendar of events, everyone should have one of these. If not, it's gonna be on the right-hand side of your computer panel. It's gonna say handouts. Go ahead and click on the handouts and that will show the calendar of events. Our next event is gonna be July 20th. We're gonna have a guest speaker, Mike Bennett, uh, same time at 11.30. He's gonna go over the importance of estate planning for yourself as well as your heirs. And we have a bio of our guest speaker today, Mr. Pete, that will also be here in the handouts. And we also have a notes page. Go ahead and feel free to write down some questions. Any questions, you can go ahead and write them down in the question box, there's a chat box. Click on the chat box, type in your question, and we will answer that today at the end. And we're gonna do a quick test. If everyone wants to try this out, we're gonna put in there what everyone had for breakfast. I'm gonna put my answer here. We'll give everyone about 30 seconds to see what they had for breakfast. So I had eggs, toast, and coffee, so make sure everything's working there. Let's wait for a couple answers. All right, perfect. Looks like a lot of people had some breakfast here, that's good. Some quick Ariana news. She just turned four years old a couple weeks ago. This is a, a picture here on the left. So she loves her dancing. She will change about five times a day, mostly dresses. And there's either something on the floor or in the closet, but she loves to, to change her gear all the time. We also starred her on golf. As you can see here in the backyard, it's just a little plastic golf club with golf balls, and she loves to hit them around the backyard. So at four years old, they're Definitely getting a lot more coordinated. And she can't wait to be a big sister. She has this little baby brother toy. You know, it's about this big and she'll put in her baby stroller. She'll push the little baby brother around. She'll change his clothes. She'll feed him. She'll change the diaper, which is gonna be coming forward here in the next few weeks. We also pulled out the uh, infant car seat put that into the living room so we're getting ready. She'll take baby brother from her stroller, put him in the car seat, get him all secure. So she's she's very excited to be a big sister. And my wife, Sunny, as you can see here, she's about 34 weeks pregnant. She's growing, getting lots of sleep, eating lots of ice cream. It's like every other day we're going to Safeway just to get that ice cream. But everyone's been happy and healthy and just a few more weeks left. Okay. Today we're gonna to go over the market review of the first quarter, what happened from January 1 to March 31st in 2021, as well as what we see moving forward and what challenges and obstacles we face with inflation, taxes, as well as other areas. Our guest speaker today joins us from Clark Capital. Uh, many of you uh, know them already. And Clark has been managing money since 1986, about 35 years. They manage clients' assets of about $22 billion. And Pete is a portfolio manager. He works on the custom portfolio side. Many of you remember him from about a year and a half ago at the Berkeley Country Club. Uh, you, you can't meet Piss if, or you can't meet Miss Pete if you enter the room. He's about six foot 10, real good guy, uh, very nice and, and very caring. And back in the day, about 30 years ago, we were just talking about this before, he played D1 basketball at Santa Clara University. 
So with no further ado, uh, please welcome Pete Eisenrich. And Great, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Pete. Bear with me, I'm just gonna change over Pete to presenter. Uh, there we go, yeah, and I we see your screen. Screen is up, good, all right, you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you okay, yeah, thank you. Great, okay, thank you, Nathan, thanks for the introduction, and yeah, I certainly have good memories of being up in Berkeley last year and doing the presentation up there. Um, it's always nice to be back in the Bay Area. As Nathan said, that's where I went to school, Santa Clara. Played with a pretty good teammate, Steve Nash. You might have heard of him. So we, we were, uh, I hate to say it, I think one of the last good Santa Clara teams here in the last 25 or 30 years. But uh, anyway, really glad to be with you today. And this is kind of good news that I want to share with you. I was just telling Nathan this. I shot him an email first thing this morning. We literally just got our latest economic quarterly review deck approved. Um, and completed. So this is as hot off the press as we can get. This is our current thinking of where the market is, what the economy is doing, kind of give you our sense of what happened in the first quarter and kind of relay it to 2020 and how 2020 really uh, ran. And then kind of as we're moving into 2021, what we're seeing a little bit different this year. Um, so Without any further ado, I'm going to jump right into it. So I, we usually start our presentations with these five gauges. I'm sure if you were in Berkeley last year, you saw these gauges as well. This gives our kind of 30,000 foot view of the world and where we think the broad positives and negatives are when we look at the, the overall economic environment and really how it impacts the capital markets. And you can see here, we've got three gauges that are in positive territory, two that are in negative territory, and obviously anything to the right of neutral is positive, anything to the left of neutral is negative. We made two changes as we move into the second quarter. We brought investor sentiment back a little bit, that's that fourth gauge, and then interest rates we brought back one notch, still very much positive territory, but we did bring that one notch back in, in our estimation. And as I go through the next several slides, I'll tell you why. So we'll get into where these gauges sit and why and how we think that creates the backdrop for the capital market environment. Kind of big picture executive summary. What we're seeing right now is global economies, clearly the US included, are improving and earnings are rebounding. I mean, we're really seeing this bounce back as you would expect from a really tough period in the spring and summer of last year as much of the world was shut down. We're really in that still, we would say that V-shaped part of this rebound in the economic recovery. And that means outsized economic growth. We're really seeing earnings recover strongly. And that really is setting up the, the kind of you know, environment as we move through 2021. As I mentioned, we have three of our gauges are positive. Two are negative. I would probably argue the really important gauges economy, uh, monetary policy, and interest rates. Those are probably the biggest ones. Those three are the positives. And then that investor sentiment and valuations are the two that are that are somewhat negative. We came out at the beginning of the year with an S&P 500 price target of 4150. I looked right before I jumped on the call with Nathan. And Nathan, I think we're at 4160 right now. So we it actually was interesting our, our chief investment officer to his credit he really thought this would be a more front-end loaded year he thought we would kind of have a better start to the year where there's still good news that's hitting the market and maybe a, a more volatile second half of the year um we're still seeing a positive backdrop when we look at earnings and the economy so you know there's no reason why things can't keep improving but we probably should be prepared for a little bit more volatility as we, I know we're not in the second half of the year, but as we kind of approach that second half of the year. The 10 year treasury probably been one of the biggest news items is where interest rates have gone this year. We ended 2020 with the 10 year yield below 1%. I think it was at 90, you know, in the mid 90 basis points, 93, 94, 95 basis points. So 0.9% was where the yield was at. That really ran dramatically higher, got to over 1.7% as one, at one point in, in the first quarter of this year. That's a really dramatic increase. I'll kind of talk to you about that, how we're viewing that, how that kind of impacts the way we manage bond portfolios and kind of what we're looking at as we go through 2021. You can see that range is about one and a quarter to two. I think that's when we increased uh, that range recently. 
So, you know, that's been a pretty big move in those yields further out on the yield curve. And I'll talk all about that. Final bullet point, as you can see, we do expect more volatility in the second half of the year. So let's look at those gauges. So that economy gauge, um, why is it positive? Housing has been one real strong part in this economic recovery. I'm sure you've all heard it. Certainly, if most of you are in the Bay Area, I'm sure you're feeling it. I'm in the Denver area. We're feeling it out here. Very strong housing market. And we call that a leading indicator because a lot of things kind of spur from housing. So when housing's doing well, it helps a lot of other parts of the economy do well. And that has really been one of the cores. And why do we kind of bring that up? Boy, for me, it's just such a contrast to 08 and 09, where when we think of housing being at the core of the problem of the economy with the over leverage and the, the housing market bubble bursting, you know, that was the core of the problem and really why it was a very painful downturn that we had in 2008 and 2009. Kind of nice that on this side, this, this recovery that we're enjoying, housing is really one of the leading areas of the economy. Retail sales are at all time highs. I always say it is tough to keep US consumers down. We are a consumer-based society. We like spending and boy, we do it very well. And, and again, for better or worse, about 70% of our economy is you and I out spending money. So consumer spending is a really big core part of the economic engine of the US economy. And we're really seeing strength in consumers from a spending side, their balance sheets look really good. We're seeing kind of when we look at what we call a consumer's debt service ratio, we're seeing that at very, very low levels, um, considering where it was in 08 and 09, where we were really over leveraged. You can make an argument that there's actually some pent up spending that consumers could do this time around. And boy, I'll tell you what, getting checks sent directly to a big part of the consumer base, that helps. And we know these stimulus packages you know, you know, have had money go directly to consumers. That has helped really keep consumers in a strong financial position. Vaccine availability, I think, I mean, it's an understatement of the year if I say we're all ready to get past this pandemic. Obviously, as this vaccine is becoming more and more available, we think that's nothing but a positive as consumers are more comfortable going out more and kind of engaging in more traditional economic activity that they used to do prior to the pandemic. Unemployment heading in the right direction, it's still elevated, it's still north of 6%. For some comparison, we're at three and a half percent unemployment in December of 2019, so before the pandemic. So we still got some some damage to repair in the job market, but it is clearly improved. We were north of 14 percent unemployment in the worst month, kind of in the spring of last year. Um, our GDP forecast: we're really expecting five percent plus GDP growth. That is really impressive economic growth, and yes, it's. We're, because we were coming from a low, we're having this really strong rebound, but that does impact how we look at stocks, how we look at bonds. Um, we are way above trend. We would call that 5% growth way above trend. I think we average, you know, I think post credit crisis, we were averaging about 2% GDP growth. This is obviously more than twice that. And if anything, that 5% might end up being a little bit low. So we'll see where this economic growth goes, but why do we care about the GDP growth, boy, that helps earnings. And why do we care about earnings? Well, here is a picture, and I, you know, we've used this a few times, kind of maybe I think one of the best pictures of the market. You know, when we get into all these little details of what's driving the market, boy, we got an election coming up. We got to the Fed doing something. What drives the market over the long run? The gold line here is operating earnings of the S&P 500 and the, the blue line is the S&P 500, the price movement of the S&P 500. Now, I'm not a math major, but that looks pretty darn correlated to me. In the long run, earnings are really what drive the market. Yes, in the short run, different things can have an impact on market. And again, we see that volatility in the market and that's part of the deal of being an equity investor. But over the long run, stock you know, stock prices are really driven by earnings. And I think this does a great picture of showing that. Let's think about monetary policy gauge, full forward position in that monetary policy gauge. Why is it so positive? Well, gosh, the Fed, you know, I guess they could do more, but it's hard to imagine the Fed doing much more than what they've done really starting March of last year with immediately cutting rates to zero to 25 basis points, engaging in a quantitative easing program. Remember that word from 08 and 09, that's the Fed out buying bonds. 
They actually, this time around, said they'd be willing to buy corporate bonds. They would even buy high yield bonds, depending if they fell into certain categories. So we would say this is a Fed in full accommodative mode. Zero interest, that's what that ZERP stands for, is zero interest rate policy. They have told us they're not raising rates or even considering raising rates for the next couple of years. So we can believe at this point that we're gonna be in a really low interest rate environment for the foreseeable future. Quantitative easing is still ongoing. Um, tapering, and think about this, if we think about people who are worried about interest rates moving higher, the Fed moving interest rates higher, probably they'll stop their quantitative easing program first. So there's, there is a, a you know, kind of a sequence to this and probably their bond buying, they would stop bond buying before they would start increasing interest rates. So we'll probably get a little bit better sense of when those interest rate increases might come when we look at what they're doing on the bond buying side and that's that quantitative easing program. Um, if the Fed gets uncomfortable with how those longer term yields are moving higher, there's nothing that says they can't go out and buy those treasury bonds and they can try to suppress those longer term interest rates. We always kind of think in our business, the Fed really controls short term interest rates. The market controls those longer term interest rates a little bit better. But if you have a buyer like the Federal Reserve come in and start to buy those bonds longer out and keep those interest rates down, that would have an impact in the market and kind of help you know, mitigate some of the increase we might see in interest rates. And why does that matter when the Fed is stimulating? Here is that zero interest rate policy where we were coming out of 08 and 09, the Fed cutting interest rates to zero to 25 basis points. But here's another really good chart where we kind of superimpose the red line, which that's the Fed's balance sheet. And when we look at this, this is in trillions of dollars. So these are big numbers we're talking about. And then we kind of superimpose the S&P 500 on top of that. We have seen, and this really is kind of coming out of 08 and 09, when the Fed is opening up the spigot and really aggressive with their quantitative easing, that has been a good back backdrop for, for equities. And you can kind of see that pretty clearly in this slide in 08 and 09, them kind of immediately trying to get the economy going. QE1, QE2, we had Operation Twist. So we can see during that period of time when the Fed is engaging in QE, that tends to be a good backdrop for stock markets. And they have signaled to us, you know, us, the market, that they are gonna be engaged in QE here for the foreseeable future and really want to get this economy growing much stronger and really have a robust recovery from that shutdown we went through because of the pandemic. That third gauge is valuations and that we have slightly negative. And why is that? Well, when we look at the long-term averages, stocks, when we look at the price to earnings ratio or PE ratio, they're at pretty elevated levels. They're at, they're above their, their historical norms and they're at kind of levels we haven't seen in about 20 years. But I think one important point, and we say this when PE ratios are really low and stocks look cheap or when they're really high and stocks look expensive, what we do see historically is that stock market valuations have not been a great timing device. So kind of a simpler way to think about it is stocks can stay expensive for a while and stocks can stay cheap for a while. Just because they're cheap doesn't mean they're gonna turn up and start to rally. And just because they're expensive doesn't mean they're gonna turn over and start to go downward. So they're not good at calling those turning points. We do look at the world more broadly. We can't just look at stock market valuations. We have to look at them compared to what else can investors invest in. And when we look at them relative to bonds, and this isn't gonna surprise y'all with how low bond interest rates are, when bond interest rates are low, we tend to see those valuations of the stock market go higher and stocks, and I'll show you how we measure this, they still do look attractive relative to bonds. We do think it's important that earnings do catch up. You know, the stock market is, when we look at it in aggregate, the valuation is high. So we need that earnings or that E side to grow. We're seeing that and expected earnings growth is supposed to be really robust this year, but that will be important that, kind of valuations start to match where stock prices have run. We do need that valuation metric to improve, but as you can see, we can still have the stock market go up, even though valuations might not be expanding because earnings are growing at a more rapid rate. And that's really the kind of expectation we have for 2021. And why does that matter? Again, we do still think stocks have some appreciation potential. Here's that picture of the PE ratio. Um, when we look at so the top line, I'd say in our world, we look more at forward PE ratios. You know, we invest in what a company is going to earn tomorrow, not what it earned yesterday. 
but we see those PE ratios on the forward basis just under 23 times earnings with that historical average of about 15. So, I mean, that is, you know, in, you know, pretty markedly above that average, pretty expensive. And last time we see it, this expensive was the late 90s, early 2000s. So not a great parallel when we know what happened during the late 90s, the dot-com bubble burst. But remember, interest rates are quite a bit different now than where they were kind of in any other period we can look back when we think of the Fed going to this zero interest rate policy. This is kind of a tough, tough chart to look at. And, and let me have you focus literally on the second group of lines down. And what we really look at here is what we call the earning yield of stocks. So what's the earnings yield of stocks? It's the PE ratio in reverse or inverted, I should say. So it's earnings over price. So we're really trying to see how much earnings do we get for a dollar in price in the stock market? And you can see we have the red line there. The S&P 500 is about 4.96, or excuse me, it's about 4.38%. The NASDAQ 100 is about 3.58%. But when you compare that to bond yields, that's where we look at, are they expensive relative to bonds or not? And with the expected 10-year real treasury yield being negative. So again, with how low interest rates are and when we think of inflation, the real expected yield of treasuries is negative right now. It's kind of easy. You can see that math shows that we still see stocks are undervalued relative to bonds. And again, that's what that second group of lines show, that big, bold green line, that's the zero level. So when you're at that point, they're kind of stocks and bonds are you know, comparably valued. When you're above that line, stocks are undervalued relative to bonds. And below that line, stocks are expensive relative to bonds. And we're really in this clear position right now. We're on that relative basis. Stocks are attractive when compared to bonds. Investor sentiment, that fourth gauge and the one we moved back, we actually moved it back kind of a half a notch into kind of a half reverse negative position. Why is that? This is a, a gauge that really looks at speculation in the market. And we look at this on both sides. Is there too much optimism in the market? Is there too much pessimism? This is a contrarian indicator in our world. So when we see a really optimistic market and you know, everybody's positive about the market. And that's what you see on the cover of Forbes and all those kind of things. Those tend to make us a little bit nervous. Those periods of time when things are really bleak and really negative and everybody's pessimistic, you know, those tend to be as you're going through a bottoming period. And that tends to be more of an opportunity in the market. Right now, we would argue we're seeing a little bit of evidence of speculation in the market. Um, we can look at SPACs, we can look at Bitcoin. You know, a lot of things are kind of telling us, boy, there's some speculation happening in this market could be a, a near-term sign that there could be some volatility in the near term and it's been interesting to see the last week or so the volatility we've had but when we see this too much optimism or, or too much speculation that can be a near-term headwind it is a very sensitive gauge this is one that can kind of shift pretty quickly um i can tell you march of last year as we were going into april so kind of literally at 12 months ago to where we are now when things were really bleak, we were really coming off that horrible March when markets went down at a record pace, down 20, 30%. Where did we have our investor sentiment gauge? We actually changed it from March into April into a full positive position. So that shows you really a contrarian indicator. And this is, when you think about us as you know institutional professional investors, this is us leaning in the wind sometimes. And I think of the classic Warren Buffett, you know, his expression is, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. <laughs> that's kind of, that's a pretty simple way to think of this gauge. And we're in a period where people were really fearful last March. That to us was signaling a positive. And right now, it's not a full-blown, way too optimistic right now, but there is some excessive optimism in the market. So we do think, you know, this gauge should be in that negative position. The VIX index, which is a volatility index, it's kind of at these lower levels right now. That shows some complacency for us as well. And we just, again, our summary would be, this doesn't really change our broader outlook for the year. We're looking at 12 or 18 months, but it does tell us, hey, we might need to strap on the, the seat belt here for a bit of a bumpier ride as we go through this period where there might be a little bit of excessive speculation. Here's a picture of the VIX index. And again, we put the S&P 500 in blue, comparing and contrasting it. And what I would tell you is look at these big spikes in volatility. November of 2008, kind of the two prior record highs, believe it or not, in March of last year, we hit an all-time high for the VIX index. So the VIX index measures, it's called the fear index. So 
it really shows when that fear is the most uh, you know, excessive out there and really impacting the market. We hit a record level in March of last year, more volatile based on this reading than even in the 08, 09 period, believe it or not. And what's interesting, if you look at those, what do we see? Boy, if you look at the blue line, the S&P 500 below those levels, those tend to be as we're going through that bottoming period. And we know November of 2008 wasn't the bottom, but it was March of 09. So it was within a few months of that bottom. And boy, this time around, a lot of that action happened in March where we had the big spike in volatility and that big sell-off in equities. As equities started to reverse, volatility really dropped dramatically. So they really lined up pretty closely in March of last year. And that's what we're saying. You can see how the that red line has really dropped dramatically here in the last several months. Might be a little bit too much optimism in the market, maybe a, a little too little volatility out there the way we look at it. Interest rate gauge. So this final gauge, one we brought, still in a positive half forward position, but brought back one notch. Why did we do it? We really wanted to acknowledge that increase we saw in yields further out on the yield curve. So we still have a Fed that's keeping interest rates down. We don't think that changes for the next year or two, but markets can push those further out interest rates higher. And that's where seeing that 10 year yield move higher, we wanted to bring that, that interest rate gauge back a notch, still positive. And if we look at it, we step back, I was looking at it today, we're at about 1.5, 1.6 yield on the 10 year treasury right now. That's still really low from a historical perspective. So interest rates are still low, low cost of capital. That is still a positive for the market. But we have had that move up a little bit here in the in the first quarter of 2021. Um, so still positive with interest rates are. And the yield curve is steepening. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Something we were talking about at the beginning of the year, our bond team actually was anticipating a little bit of a steepening of the yield curve. Kind of a healthy thing if interest rates are moving up further out on the yield curve, that gives you some more opportunities in the marketplace, you know, as a bond investor, you know, we can now find yields are a little bit higher, a little bit further out. Um, we don't really expect interest rates to do move too much higher. You can see we have that top band at about 2%. So we think they've kind of had a big part of their run already this year. Why does this matter? Low interest rates, positively soaked yield curves are usually favorable for stocks. This is a slide, and if you look at the red on the bottom, what the red line on the bottom is doing is taking the 10-year treasury yield and subtracting the three-month C-bill yield. So what you think of a or what we think of a positively soaked yield curve is interest rates are higher the further out or the longer out that they are. That's a positively soaked yield curve. What that red line is showing on the far right, if we look at the action over the last couple of months, is that has absolutely happened. We've seen this steepening of the yield curve, meaning those longer dated 10-year yields are higher now than those three-month T-bills. But what's interesting, and if you look at those kind of vertical, those kind of beige columns, those are recessions. And we tend to see what we call an inverted yield curve happen prior to recession. So it's interesting, we don't use this chart too much in an environment we're in right now, we tend to use it as, as the economy has been really running for a long period of time and people get concerned that we might be heading toward a recession because we've had an inverted yield curve prior to every recession, I think since the late 60s. So a pretty good indicator for us. And we've had a couple of false indications of this. We've had a couple um, inverted yield curves that have not led to a recession, but every recession you can see here, we've had that inversion of the yield curve. So when we look at that light blue line going below zero, that's what we've seen. But we wanted to show this slide this time around because we've really seen this positive inversion of the yield curve. And if you look at that little box in the kind of upper right corner of this graph, you can see the S&P 500 performance since the early 60s to, to you know April of this year, when you're above zero, so a positively soaked yield curve, that's a good backdrop for equity. You can see up on average about over 8%. When it's negative or in that inverted yield curve position, that's where you have a tougher environment for the stock market. So we are in that steepening yield curve. As a prior bullet point said, that generally is a good backdrop for stock markets. My next couple of slides, and I'm getting near the end, and we'll absolutely open it up. We'll get Nathan back on. We'll get some Q&A going. Kind of got four topics I want to cover with you because these are questions I've been getting more often over the last few months. So these might be on your mind, questions you're asking Nathan. Let me give you our, our kind of view of what we're seeing when it comes to bonds, inflation, market rotation, and volatility. 
Bonds, why do clients own bonds? I probably had this question more often this year than I've had in the last several years of, do I want to own bonds? We know where we think interest rates are rising. We know that's a tough environment for bonds. Do we want to own bonds? Well, this is the Barclays Aggregate Index. This is the returns of the Barclays, like kind of the, the benchmark of investment grade bonds that we look at as investors. And what does this tell us? Well, gosh, this ag, we call it the ag, has been around since 1976. It has had three negative years in that history going through the end of last year. Now, what do those negative years look like? Oh my gosh, what do they look like when those bond markets are down? Well, the worst year of the ag was in 1994 when it was down a little bit over 2.9%. So we understand why clients, most clients do own bonds and should own bonds because they really are kind of that ballast or that anchor in the portfolio that can help during those March and Aprils of last year when we're really volatile on the equity side. We can see historically bonds don't have that kind of volatility and you can kind of see our not too clever title, but we say, hey, a bond bear market looks a lot different than a stock bear market. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit further and look at a balanced portfolio with you as well. This is what I'm talking about here. So here we isolate, how do stocks do, how do bonds do, and how does a 60-40 blend do on a one, three, five, 10, and 20 year basis? And we say, what's that best one year we've seen and what's that worst one year we've seen? Very dramatic, really, for most of these assets or most of these classifications. So if we look at the far left, we can see, boy, that best year for stocks in one year could be up 60%. Wow, we don't like that, right? But what is that worst year for stocks? Boy, we see down over 40%, not something most of us, I'm guessing, would want. So when we look at bonds, you can see it's a little bit more truncated, not as big of a high, not as big of a low, and we get the same thing with the 60-40 portfolio. So why do we in this business, and I'm sure it's something Nathan says to you as well, why do we say be a long-term investor? Let's try to build that long-term plan and get the portfolio built correctly, and let's not let short-term movements in the market impact the way we behave with our portfolio. And you can see as you go out three years, those numbers come in dramatically more. Out five years, you can see, boy, then now we're getting to the point where you look at that low in five years, bonds are positive in that period. So on a five-year period, bonds are positive. We've seen that historically in that 60-40, barely down. So, and that's in that worst five-year period we could find. So you can see how that continues to improve with time. And obviously 20 years, I'll grant you, is a long time, but on a 20-year basis, even those lowest 20 year periods we see as positive for stocks, bonds, and that 60 40 blend. Let's look at it one other way. And this is the frequency of positive returns for stocks, bonds, and then that 60 40 blend. And you can see that one year. I mean, this hopefully will, if we look, after we look at the last chart, this, think about this on a one year basis, 80, over 80% of the time, stocks are up. You get positive returns. So that there's still a piece of period of time where you don't get those positive returns. We can see in bonds, it's much lower. What is that? Probably close to 90% of the time you have positive returns for bonds. And then that 60, 40 is as you would expect in between those. But here, let's just look out to five years. And you can see in a five year period, those bonds right at about that 100%. And even that 60, 40 in a five year period, you know, almost 100%, it's not quite 100%, but almost 100% of the time, that 60, 40 portfolio will be up. So this is where we always reemphasize that thinking, let's use time to our advantage, not to our disadvantage as investors, and really that balance and why do we own bonds? Well, they can really help mitigate some of that volatility we have in equities. Here's a slide that just, let's talk about bonds a little bit. So there's treasury bonds, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, that's what the government issues. Um, there's corporate bonds, and corporate bonds kind of fall into two categories of investment grade or what we call high yield bonds or junk bonds is what people call those as well, and those are below investment grade. So you can see what we did is we did this kind of into current time. We went from August of last year to March 31st of this year when we had this big rise in treasuries, uh, treasury yields. What happens to treasury returns? that really is negative on treasury returns. Remember, bond prices and interest rates are inversely related. So and treasuries really trade based on what interest rates are doing. That really drives them. So when interest rates are going up, that means bought treasury bond prices are going down. But let's look at this when we think corporate bond. So investment grade bonds, different returns. We still see pretty negative in a rising interest rate environment, but not to the degree 
that treasuries are because investment grade bonds, those are company bonds. So they trade on other reasons as well, but certainly interest rates impact those. But this might surprise you. And we've looked at this and it might catch you by surprise. High yield bonds tend to do better in rising rate environments. So we look at them historically, kind of different than what you think about bond investing and rising rates, but high yield bonds tend to do better historically when we're in a rising rate environment. Again, because they're a little bit more on the risk spectrum, so they might act a little bit more like stocks in that kind of an environment where rates are going up. But you can see in that far right column, high yield bonds have done well in these rising rate environments. So I think that's an important distinction, kind of what bonds you own matters as well. Um, we looked at inflation, a question I've gotten a lot recently, and this just looks at by decade and by different asset class, what have stocks and bonds and cash done in these different environments? So the far right is inflation. And we look at just, a, let's pick a couple of decades. How about the 80s? I mean, inflation was at five and a half percent. That seems almost unbelievable or inconceivable right now to think of five and a half percent inflation. But boy, did that torpedo the stock market? No, it didn't. I mean, a really good decade for stocks and a good decade for bonds as we look at that as well. The 90s, 3% inflation, still a really good decade for stocks and a good decade for bonds. So if we do get more inflation, remember that's not necessarily uh, an immediate negative to the stock market. We've seen stocks do well in a, an inflationary environment and that's what this slide shows. We see the S&P 500, during years when we're in rising inflation, up a little bit less than 7.4%, corporate bonds up a little bit less than 6%, and then treasuries, you know, T-bills and T-bonds, you know, still positive, but not to what is as good a return as what we call risk assets having. Just a couple final slides here, and then we'll get back to Q&A. Um, I do think it's important we talk about this. So if we think about what worked really well in 2020 and what's working well so far in 2021, we have had a rotation in the market. Um, we were talking about this last year, even as it was a very large cap growth dominated environment, where really a lot of other parts of the market weren't doing well compared to that large cap growth, those big tech companies. So let's look at how they did. Look at that last line item. We kind of break out, we call it the fan mag. So Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Microsoft, Apple, and Google. Together in 2020, they were up almost 55%. That's remarkable, remarkable return, right? Um, compare that to the S&P 500 up 18%, 18.4. So again, a good year for the S&P 500, but really driven by these big tech companies. Now let's look at Q1 of this year. And we really went back and looked at this since September of last year, which is really when we saw this rotation start to occur. And it is important to kind of, as an active manager, we look at these metrics. So before we do that, let's look at 2020, the Russell 1000 growth up 38.49%. The Russell 1000 value up 2.8%. So growth dominated value. Um, clear as day, you know, you can, no ifs, ands, or buts. But let's look in the last three months, value is up 11 and a quarter percent compared to um, the growth up less than 1%. So that's a rotation, really seeing value start to do a lot better than growth. And that's what we were talking about last year. We we're saying, boy, growth seems really stretched in here, really getting kind of excessive compared to value on a relative basis. So that's where we're seeing some opportunity. And maybe the one other one I'll point out is the Russell 2000, which is small cap companies, you know, up 20% last year, 9.96%. I mean, nobody's ever gonna be upset about that kind of number, but it really lagged large cap, but it got that return late in the year. And you can see so far year to date for the first Q1 of this year, it's up 12.7. So small caps have done better than large cap where last year large cap dominated. So this year, small cap, mid cap value, they have started to do better. And that's this kind of anatomy of a rotation that we wanted to talk about. So really interesting to see what worked well last year isn't doing quite as well this year. And just to put maybe a final point on that, you can see those six companies, the fan mag, the last line in that yellow, they're up 2.4% in the last seven months, up 2.5% uh, about that in the last three months, really pale in comparison to small caps. and value stocks and you know other areas of the market equal weighted s p 500 so pretty interesting 
this is one of my favorite slides because it does show that over longer periods of time, we know historically value outperforms growth, but growth can outperform value for different segments of time. And that's these green columns. And what we were saying at the end of last year was, boy, we've had a period of since the credit crisis, really in essence, growth outperforming value. And this kind of last euphoric run that we saw into the end of 2020, kind of looks similar to that prior green column. And that's the late nineties where, and I was in the business then, I was in the Seattle area, I was in the Bay area for part of it, where it was growth and tech. And that was kind of the only thing really doing well and kind of that euphoric last run that we had in growth. But then we had a really big shift where value had a several year period where it outperformed growth after that dot-com bubble burst. Now we're not saying there's a bubble bursting here, but on a relative basis, we thought it had really gotten stretched with growth. We're seeing some opportunity and value. And that again, we're still a little bit early, but we think this is a trend that has legs. And that's what we're seeing as we move into 2021. This growth versus value, if you look at the far right, this was a three standard deviation event, being a little bit of a math geek with you. Um, a really rare event of how much growth was outperforming value. And as you would expect from that big of a stretch, We've really seen that come in very dramatically this year so far in the first quarter where value has really done well relative to growth. It was a volatile year last year. We tracked these 1% trading days. We had 109 of these 1% trading days last year. Um, but look at the company that that keeps. Goes back to 08 and 09. The last time we had these 100 plus 1% trading days, the prior time before that was the dot-com period, late 90s, early 2000s where we got those one plus percent trade days. Really volatile year last year. If you thought it was a volatile year, boy, you were right. The first quarter of this year, we have about 18 of those trading days that are up or down 1%. We average about 64 of those in a typical calendar year. This is a slide, I've got a couple of final slides. This is really the idea of it's about the time in the market and not timing the market. And you can see what we did here was simply look at what the S&P 500 has done, and this does not include dividends, this is just price only on these highs prior to these major downturns. So right before the dot-com bubble burst, right before September 11th, and right before um, the credit crisis really hit. And what does it tell us? Boy, we can see that the S&P 500 is still up well over 100%, 150% in all these time periods. So yes, those are long periods of time from 2000 and 2001, but it really is about time in the market and not trying to time the market. And to be clear again, this doesn't include dividends either. So, um, you know, just shows that, you know, these markets have recovered from these periods where if somebody had been the worst market timer in the last 20 years, if they had just kind of stuck with their investments, they would have still done okay as we look at it now, you know, all these years later. I kind of went through this already in that prior slide, but really here we're showing what the first quarter looked like compared to 2020 in the last seven months. Again, kind of this rotation, we're seeing small, mid, value doing better. On uh, the international side, not doing as well as the US, but still positive results, uh, results on emerging and developed economies. But boy, look at the bond returns in Q1, really a tough environment for bonds. But remember, we were talking about high yield bonds. That's the one area up so far in the first quarter when it comes to fixed income up about 85 basis points so not impressive returns but still positive in that high yield space my final slide we do think we are still in a secular bull market um, secular for us that's kind of a longer period the longer trend doesn't mean we don't get cyclical bear markets along the way we can and we do and boy we had a doozy of one last year last march we had a real bit you know real impactful cyclical bear market, but we still think the long-term trend is a secular bull. We track the last two secular bulls. You can see coming off that low in 1942 and the low in 1974, they lasted 18 and 22 years. So we're 12 or so years into this secular bull. Those timeframes don't need to repeat themselves, but if those give us some sort of a guide, we could still have a few years left in this secular bull market that we believe we're in. So with that um well let's go to q a and let me bring up my final couple of slides here just get the disclosures out here but any questions um let, let's go with those so nathan you're welcome to jump back on i don't know if you've gotten any questions but let me bring you back into the call perfect appreciate it pete thank you so much let's go ahead we're going to take a couple minutes here to take some q a 
anyone has any questions, go ahead and put them down in the chat box. We'll just take a couple minutes here, Pete. Very informative. Yeah. And Pete, you were mentioning, you know, with, with interest rates, we have uh, we have clients who have extra money now, you know, that they're not traveling, they'll have money in their, their checking accounts or their money markets or their savings, but they might not be getting, you know, the interest that they want. Are muni bonds a good option to be looking into? Yeah, no, it's a great point. Yeah, we know, and that's where the Fed really controls that front end of the yield curve. So by keeping interest rates low, they're almost kind of forcing you to get into something else if you want to try to get any real return. So you're right, money market funds and you know savings accounts, very extremely low interest rates, if anything, right now. So I think you know municipal bonds, corporate bonds, are there opportunities in both of those areas? Um, you know, with the discussion of higher taxes, we know muni bonds have really kind of had you know a pretty good run here. You know, starting in 2020. Um, you know, and, and into this year, we know most bond categories are down so far this year. So, you know, that you have to understand as being a bond investor as well, that there can be a little bit of volatility with the bond side. But you're right, for somebody that kind of has money that they don't need kind of access to in the next few months or next several months, you know, I think, yeah, looking at other areas in that fixed income, whether they're muni bonds or corporate bonds, yeah, I think there's there are opportunities out there. Yeah, it's a good question, Nathan. Tough environment for savers, you know, and that's where you know you guys you might say, gosh, Pete, why do you have interest rates as being such a positive? I'm a saver. It's hard for me. It's hard to earn money. We look at an economic environment. So low cost of capital helps borrowers and businesses get money more cheaply. But boy, we understand that is a tough environment for savers. And it's a challenging fixed income environment out there uh, right now. We know it's, you know, it is a challenge out there, but yeah, there are other opportunities if you have some time, you know, that you can can kind of put stuff away looking at those other bond categories, munis or corporate bonds. Very good. Thank you. Get another one here. And you you just touched on this as well, you know, the six stocks and tech that are are doing yeah. really well. For for clients in the line who have concentrated stocks such as Chevron, Apple, Google, you know, what other options can they can they do cover calls? Can you describe that a little bit and how that can help them? Yeah, and that's something, and again, we, it is something we do at Clark Capital for clients with concentrated stock positions. And again, this would certainly be working with Nathan and make sure it makes sense for you and what you're trying to get out of that. If you have a concentrated position that you want to keep a certain amount in that particular stock, there are often, and we kind of look at it, we say, is this is this a stock that's a good candidate for covered calls? There is a way, and it's kind of a way, I think, to just try to get a little bit of income from those holdings where when you write a covered call, you're kind of collecting, you know, you're in essence kind of selling that call. So you're collecting some premium on that. So you can, you know, get a little bit of additional income from that. But I mean, there's risk as well with, with covered calls, you know, where if the stock is really rallying, it's kind of a challenging environment to write covered calls in that environment. But yeah, there, there are things you can do. I'm glad you bring it up, Nathan, because if those are things that you, as a personal client, you know, if you're looking at and you want to talk to Nathan about, those are things we at Clark can look at with you and say, boy, you know, if there is a piece that is going to stay concentrated, is it a good candidate to maybe write some covered calls and kind of what does that mean if you get into a covered call program? That is something we can look at doing. Yep. Help protect and generate cash off it. That's good. Yeah, it does a little bit of protection, but you know there is still some downside. You know, if there's a big price movement down. You know, you kind of keep that premium, but you still own that stock. So there is a little bit of downside there that can happen, but it is a way to try to collect a little bit of income and, and to get some income from a, uh, you know, from a, a concentrated position is usually how we look at that. Yep. Very good. Just check here. Perfect. We're, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, Great, I'll stop sharing my screen. So hopefully I'm kind of bringing you back yeah. on here. <laughs> we got, yeah, big cameras now, which is perfect. Oh, do we? Okay, all right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for joining us, Pete. Uh, for any other clients on the line who have more questions, you know, you have our number, our email. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you again for, for joining us and everyone have a good day. We look forward to seeing everyone in person again. So yeah, thank thanks you. everybody. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye.